Welcome, everybody, to the discussion section or session, which is, of course, overly long. And this is why we decided to fill it with uh, very good brains and very good speakers, so that others will not feel that it's all boring. We shall today have five um, announced participants and one um, intervention participant. Uh, the rules are simple. Every participant will, um, of the discussion will introduce him or herself and immediately provide a kind of thoughts, ideas, mission, vision, dream, statement, uh, declaration, whatever you call, and about whatever you find interesting, possibly in the context of today's conference, possibly, but not, uh, it's not mandatory. Um, the participants represent uh, quite many countries, and they start from the sequence how they are printed in the program. So Penti Kueala, who is representing Finland and Estonia, Kai Murberry, who speaks perfect Estonian, but uh, he's Finnish, Hans speaks from uh, Norway, Ivo Lepland, who is today representing Estonia. Loretta, Loretta Kelpscheiter in Kiena, she was Estonian about 15 years ago, now she's Lithuanian. And a new face in the panel, Lise Kikas from Estonia, Ministry of Climate. You're welcome to pick up your seat. So the first question goes to the audience. Who should start? <laughs> Any ideas? Oh, that was too tough question. Okay, you, you tell who will start. Working now. So I'm Kai Mirbari, originally from the Finnish Institute of Marine Research. But as <coughs> Robert Flinkman said, the Finnish government did their best decision ever in 2008 to close the institute. And since then, I have been in the Finnish Environment Institute and I'm a physical oceanographer. But in, the, in this circuit time, I have been working with the so-called trilateral Finnish, Estonian, and Russian cooperation of the Gulf of Finland environment. And so this uh, cooperation started in 1968 as a <coughs> cooperation between Finland and the Soviet Union. But at that time, there were three cities which were strong in this cooperation with Tallinn, Helsinki, and Leningrad. And from 1992, that was really true uh, cooperation uh, between the three countries, uh, the Iparian countries of the Gulf of Finland. And then we had the first Gulf of Finland year, 1996, and the second was in 2014. And the second one was very big, organized by, by Syke. And during this year, we had the first uh, uh, bad signals from Russia, this uh, occupation of the Crimea, and the uh, year was somehow a little bit, uh, so to say, it was firstly at very high level. The presidents were the patrons of the year, but of course, after this uh, event, uh, and then the, uh, this kind of ministerial level uh, <coughs> visits were, were cancelled. Well, anyway, we did during the year a lot of events and the Gulf of Finland, uh, this kind of um, monitor report of the Gulf of Finland state, which was quite comprehensive. And what I'm concerned today is not only about what happens in Ukraine and so on, and what is Russian aggression against uh, the rest of the world, but, but one thing which, if we come from the politics to the environmental scientists, one thing which is we are lacking is the data flow from Russia. I know that Helcom still gets some data, but of course, in, during the, the coming years, as the situation keeps us at, as it is, we can just think about that the data flow will decrease, not increase. And so when the Gulf of Finland year 2014 has its 10-year celebration next year, I, I think that we should somehow discuss how this cooperation goes on with, without Russia, what happens if something positive happens in Russia? Are we ready to cooperate? Do we have the own network still uh, 
uh, available and how we can then deal with the Gulf of Finland and the Baltic Sea uh, status if we don't have data from Russia. What about if Aranda one day measures at our eastern point in Harpasari some very high uh, concentration of phosphorus, which means that uh, the St. Petersburg water purification system has breaked down and things like that. So I, I think that we need next year some kind of meeting where also we have a uh, ministerial uh, people, politicians, NGOs and scientists to work and to discuss together where we are now and what kind of scenarios we will have. Uh, I, I have discussed it in Finland with uh, several ministries, but there is a little bit of silence that nobody wants to, to make the, to use the word Russia uh, anymore. It's like a forbidden word, but I think that we should discuss openly what will happen in the, in the future. But that's what, what is my message for today. Thanks. Thank you very much, Kai. And I knew that Juha was biased towards a Finnish guy. So now the second question goes to Arno, who can't be biased anymore because the Finnish guy had the word already. Who should be the next now? Yes, well, let's try how this goes. Is, is, the, is the microphone on? Yes. Yes, uh, Ivo Lepland is my name, and I'm a Estonian geologist, marine geologist, working these days mainly in, in Norway, at the Geological Survey of Norway, but also I'm affiliated to, as a researcher, guest researcher with universities in Tartu and Tallinn, and also the Geological Survey of, of, of Estonia. Being marine geologist, Gulf of Finland, I have to say, is a real Disneyland. There are attractions all over the place and you want to take these scientific environmental rides again and again and again. So, uh, so with all these complicated geology behind it, with the depositional basins, erosional areas, with the sediment accumulating in certain areas, being eroded from other areas, making, and then the salinity variations in a water column and the uh, chemoclines and, uh, and all sorts of cli uh, clines developing both in sediments and also in a water column. It is a really unique environment that deserves close look from the geological perspective, both uh, as, a, as a target for the scientific uh, studies, numerous, numerous fundamental scientific discoveries are yet to be made of the unique uh, microbial ecosystems at the seafloor, formation of these manganese iron oxide, hydroxides on the seafloor that are both considered as perhaps the economic resource, but also as the, as the environmentally sensitive, uh, sensitive objects that can cause the eutrophication and, and also all, all, other, all other types of effects. And, uh, and then you, we, we have to put it all into the context of the current environmental state and the seafloor and the geological processes really play an important role actually are the backbone of, of many of these processes, what we see in a photo, photo column and down the, down the food chains in, a, in a biology. So, so good collaboration that has been, uh, has been uh, uh, stressed during, throughout this meeting here is really the backbone of, the, of getting the best handle upon the unique resource what we have here as a common ground called for Finland. Thank you. Very clear. So the next question goes to the audience again. So I, I target that to our Italian, Italian Estonian guy, Andrea. Andrea, what, who do you think should be the next now? So uh, I was. Ex when uh, Tarmo said that the next who will choose uh, is our Italian guys, so more or less I understood that that will be my turn. <laughs> so, uh, when somebody uh, asked me uh, that, can you describe who you are? I always uh, feeling quite a big challenge on that. Because I start my journey from uh, studying uh, physics, a simple, uh, simple physics. Uh, <laughs> oh, uh, into comparison with the oceanography, it's it's physics is very simple. Um, but I always want, wanted and I was willing to work uh, with the Baltic Sea, 
And um, my master thesis, the person who lead my master thesis said, okay, Loretta, if you want to continue with the uh, Baltic Sea, then you should go to Estonia. The best oceanographers in all three Baltic states are there and try a way how to do that. So, and that's how I end up in, in, in Estonia in, and I started to deal with the waves and physical oceanography. And I always was jealous uh, when I was participating in the Gulf of Finland days and uh, listening to the talks uh, about uh, how that our theoretical work can be applied uh, can be applied and applied for the for the governmental use for the how it can be translated to the simple citizens and even if it, if that Gulf of Finland days uh, scientific events are very in comparison with the Baltic Sea Science Congress is very small and talks only about this small area, uh, but we never should forget that um, it can be later broadened to the all Baltic Sea. And the same issues uh, can be found in different parts of the Baltic. Like for example, as Kai already have mentioned that now in, in nowadays um, Situation one day we can measure some phosphorus increasing in phosphorus and we know that it came from from Russia But that's issue not only for the Gulf of Finland. That's also issue for the Koronian Lagoon uh, Because we don't know what may happen on the our, our other side of the Koronian Lagoon and Koronian Lagoon is one of the largest lagoon in Europe not only in the Baltic uh, what will happen if Russians will decide that they want to have their own entrance into the Koronian Lagoon. It's less than one kilometer uh, at the beginning. It's, for them, that's nothing. Polish already have shown that that's doable. And we should not um, look at Russia now as at enemies. They're still um, a gay game players in the Baltic Sea environment. And with the example of Gulf of Finland, Koronian Lagoon and other places in the Baltic, we should learn and think and to prognose how we should deal with that and looking forward to, to the future scenarios. Thank you very much, Loretta. We still have some other international guests who are at least temporarily Estonians. So now I'm asking from the last row, Mikolai, who out of three is your choice as the next speaker? <laughs> Mikolai is from Poland. Yes, hello. <laughs> I have no particular order of uh, preference that I would go with. You have to decide. <laughs> I know. It's a big pressure element. Uh, so how about going with uh, Ivo Lepland? Oh, yes. already taken. So I'll take already. another go. Already taken. <laughs> ah, <sorry. laughs> That's a check. I, I am horrible with associ a, associating yeah. names. Yeah. That's a check where the students are following. <laughs> this yeah. yeah, follow the story. And how about uh, simply going by a uh, somewhat German sounding name of Hans, even if it's not <laughs> German. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, then uh, yeah, I'm Hans Bies. I'm uh, working at the NTNU in Trondheim. And um, I'm working together with Tom at the moment and Loretta uh, on yeah, investigating um, the fact of waves on the Baltic shores, and uh, we in uh, Norway have this uh, EEA program where we cooperate uh, with the Baltic countries. So it's a great opportunity for us to, to work together with an area where we, from NTNU's perspective, uh, maybe not so often active. The Baltic Sea is for us far away in that sense. Um, so it's a very interesting project for us. We have maybe a bit different perspective. We are and our main focus is maybe not the process itself, but we come from a methods point of view. What we try to do is we build 
uh, numerical models that can represent um, the physics outside, so we try to represent it as closely as possible. Um, so that's where we put our energy in. Most of the time we develop software, and uh, yeah, tomorrow we're going to show a bit how we are tackling this and how we try to um, yeah, work together here uh, towards uh, understanding the processes at the Baltic Coast uh, better. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Hans. And then uh, the tasks for people from audience is becoming simpler and simpler. So our <laughs> Latvian guest who was um, Estonian 10 years ago, approximately Maya, who is your choice out of the two remaining ones. <laughs> Great. Me, okay. <laughs> I didn't know it was, yeah. Uh, so, uh, I'm uh, Lise Pikas from, um, currently from the Ministry of Climate, but I must say that in the beginning of the year it was uh, called uh, before Ministry of the Environment. So, but now the restructuring now I'm uh, representing here, Ministry of, of Climate. But still in the regarding uh, marine uh, environment, uh, relations and uh, and actually currently I'm I am a coordinator of uh, Helcom Estonian Helcom uh, delegation and also all the the so I'm pretty much uh, <laughs> I have the, the main knowledge <laughs> what concerns about Estonian uh, scientists and and experts participating in the the large uh, Baltic Sea protection um, work and the Helcom uh, uh, umbrella. So, um, and, and I'm actually, I have the marine um, background, uh, hydrographer I am, and also um, environmental management uh, master's degree. So uh, I have the, like the physics background, but also regarding the impacts of, of different uh, and, uh, human um, uh, pressures to the environment. And I have been, um, basically whole my, my career, I have been involved with the uh, with the Baltic Sea and, and sea environment impacts. So this is uh, very my topic and I am actually very happy that uh, in current position I can work with uh, policy makers and also marine scientists and uh, experts because I try to be this translator between uh, the scientific uh, research and, and because we see that our decisions must be really based on the, on the scientific research. So, and also, as, as Kai mentioned, uh, currently the work in Helcom is very, prop let's say it's, it's difficult because, uh, as, as we all know, officially the, the work has been stopped, but still, fortunately, um, in official consultation among the European Union parties, uh, who are also parties of the, of the Helcom Convention, uh, we are still doing a lot of cooperation and all the work is, is still ongoing. As also mentioned today was uh, the Baltic Sea Action Plan and it was just recently in, in 2021 we took that uh, new commitments above us and, and we need to uh, take into force 199 activities and now we are actually lacking one partner of the, of the convention so it is uh, difficult. We really try to, at least uh, in written form, still ask for an expert level, get some input from, from the Russian parties, but it is difficult. And uh, yes, uh, the situation is that on the higher uh, levels, we do not do such good cooperation anymore, unfortunately. Thanks a lot. That's also a very clear statement and I apologize to those nations who haven't had yet uh, the opportunity to, to, to ask or to say who is the next because only one in the panel has left, but you all have opportunity to ask uh, later. As you may have recognized, uh, it's first of all a very wide spectrum of people here and most of them are like bridges between either different sectors or, or different nations or different countries. And the last, uh, of course, but not least, representative uh, of our community in this panel, Pente Koyala, is like a living bridge uh, between Finland, Alto, and, and uh, Estonia, Tallinn University of Technology. You're welcome. Okay, so thank you. 
So my, my background is naval architecture, so I, I, of course, my main topic is maritime transport, as, as you may be heard from my presentation. And actually, Gulf of Finland is very important for me because I got my professorship because the city of Kotka in 2006, city of Kotka gave money to the, in that time, TKK, that without money of uh, Kotka, I could never have been a professor, I'm, I'm most probably. So Gulf of Finland is very important. And in Kotka, we had a Medikotka Research Center, and we had a lot of cooperation between Finland, Estonia, and also Russia. We had this border money, a lot of European Union border money. It was very good money. And of course, now we don't have that money, so it's a, it's a pity. Uh, but my background is, and I was very active in 2014 in Gulf of Finland, yeah, so we had a very nice trip to St. Petersburg, a very historical trip, very nice, nice things, but good memories about this cooperation. But maybe I want to raise uh, maybe three topics. Maybe first one you can guess about this winter navigation, so I'm sure we can do more together, especially Estonia, Finland, maybe Sweden, that how many icebreakers we need together, why every country is thinking how many icebreakers they need, so maybe we can think about what is the most economical and most safety and more, more environmental friendly way to cooperate. That I know politically it's difficult, but scientifically we can do something. I mean, that's one topic I'm happy to cooperate. And of course, Russia also has icebreakers, so soon when, when if one day it's possible to continue the work, so I'm very happy to get them in once they, they behave better way. And second very important topic, nobody is, is has a moon, it, it, not today, but even not in any public uh, literature, it's this kind of a oil transport. You know, mm. we have a lot of oil transport still, and nobody knows what kind of a, what kind of a crew we have, uh, what kind of a vessels we have. Of course, we know the names, but we should actually make a study together that how, what are the risks today about this oil accident. We have new type of vessel, new type of crew on board, uh, it's definitely a cooperation uh, and, uh, and it's related to Russia because they will export oil heavily still in, some, in Gulf of Finland and every day there's big tankers. So it's uh, one, one important topic, we should cooperate somehow and have a link to Russia, I don't know how we link it, but that's another thing. But even our president in, a year ago, Sauli Niinistö, who is a very strong character, he said that we can stop all cooperation with Russia, but we have, we have to be worried about oil transport. He's mentioned it in an official president, <laughs> this New Year speech, so our president will support it, that we do something together to think about oil transport risks. And maybe the third one, it is because we drop it up, so again, that also we, we have ministry here, the ministry people. We have a lot of science, but that's nothing. We have to change science to actions. <laughs> We have to somehow cooperate that we get science to the political decision makers. And we have been discussing a lot, but there's a lot we can do together that we have a lot of scientific results, a lot of papers. But how to make that for the to, 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 to scientific, uh, to make it the decision makers right decision. So three topics which I'm happy to continue cooperation. And I said, I'm, I'm traveling between, I'm always between Helsinki, between Helsinki and Tallinn, so almost all, all the time, so on, on the ferry. <laughs> so I'm between Estonia and Finland, so. And this last question is uh, far from being rhetoric, and Bent is actually showing how to convince um, policymakers it's by tagging things uh, in terms of money. <laughs> what does it cost to have more waiting minutes? Yes, yes. Uh, and if you divide the... Uh, cost of ship day by um, number of minutes in a, uh, in a day, then you get several thousands of euros or dollars per yeah. each minute yes, while exactly. the ship is waiting. Yeah. So, as you have now seen, um, it's a very extraordinary spectrum of people here, and the research is focusing on greatly different timescales, while Hans is modeling things which are starting from milliseconds, I believe, so at least if not milliseconds, then seconds, definitely, perhaps milliseconds. Milliseconds, yeah. Then Loretta is looking at uh, coastal changes which happen in hours and days. Um, Pente is looking at seasons. It's not ice age, fortunately. It's much faster. <laughs> uh, and then uh, perhaps uh, the longest time scale uh, is represented by Ivo Lapland. And it's, there is a perception widely spread that geology 
It's just about the past. But we have learned that the Baltic Sea Basin, the geology, can teach us so much about the future. Could you please possibly, as an unexpected and, and attacking question, how geology could be useful for glimpse, glimpsing into future? Oh, well, thanks. Thanks for this intriguing question. So that, so that when it comes to these environmental aspects and, and Geology is typically somewhere at the side, and the biologists and the hydrologists and, and, and water column uh, people get most of the attention, and, and the geologists, yeah, are hiding behind. But I think uh, you get to the right point, point that the geology is, is not t telling us only what happened in the past, but it, it also tells us what's happening in the present. And we can, we can, we, we really need to use our geology knowledge to predict, predict possible scenarios, particularly to the Gulf of Finland area, which is really sensitive to environmental changes and, and how, the, how the nutrient balance could really be changed if we, if we, if we have a big, big disaster from the oil tanker or if we have uh, reduced water exchange with, uh, with the boiled oceans and then the anoxic conditions are, are, are expanding or we have a higher load of nutrients from the land again causing the productivity. So the marine, marine ecosystem, including the seafloor, would, would react to all, all of that. And, and we may reach the tipping points from the geological archives that, for example, we have been talking about the phosphorus and the, and the, and the phosphorus is coming in from the land and, and, and St. Petersburg is, is bursting into, into, into Gulf of Finland, whatever they are, they are bursting there. But if we reach the, the tipping point, then we can really release huge amounts of phosphorus from the marine sediments and also these, these concretions, these iron manganese concretions that are abounded in the seafloor, which, which suddenly may become not, not really, which, which may turn from the potential economic resource towards the, the, the environmental hazard. So all these kind of aspects need to, need to be carefully e evaluated by, by really taking best care of this unique resource, what we have in our hand. Absolutely, and we have learned from our geologists that, for example, uh, the uh, lack of oxygen in the Baltic Sea bottom is not, not a new thing. It has happened many, many times during the lifetime of the Baltic Sea. I don't know whether it comforts you, but uh, if you look into future, then having frequently lack of oxygen in our sea bottom, it's a bar. It's a feature, not a bar. Just a feature of the Baltic Sea. The second longest time scale of things here uh, is actually covered by both Lee Skikas and, and Kai Murberry. Uh, they are actually uh, um, making the same thing which in general could be uh, called as science diplomacy. In old times, in bad old times, uh, in uh, Cold War times, Helsinki Commission was uh, almost um, a single, almost a unique channel of communication between the West and the East. So it might happen that we are facing the same situation. Uh, I hope it will not be like that, but we have to prepare also against this kind of situation. And scientists are well known as ambassadors of uh, not only their countries, but of the style of thinking which is thought to be reasonable in, in different countries. So uh, <clears throat> what do you think both of you choose in, which, in whatever sequence you comment? How could science um, not cope with the existing situation? How could science improve the existing situation? Whether, or it is too dangerous for scientists who are not experienced in negotiations and, and, and high-level policy. Maybe we should get our hands out of policy. What do you think from different perspectives? <laughs> <laughs> yes, ladies first, as always, in dangerous places. Uh, very, uh, it's, uh, it's very very tricky <laughs> that you gave me <laughs> the first word. It's not a trap, absolutely it is, not a trap. It kind of sounds like that because <laughs> as a 
a representative of a, of a minister, I must say that I'm not in a position to say anything on behalf of Estonian Republic in that sense, uh, differently than our foreign ministry, which is uh, that, uh, yeah, it is... Um, well, as, as, as I mentioned already, that actually in, in the forum of, of Helcom work currently, we came to this kind of a soft solution that on the political level, we, we do not engage any like face-to-face -face meetings or discussions, mm. but still in written form, we asked they ask their data and we include them in development. If, if there are like new documents, new decisions coming, then they, we will send them in written form. Uh, uh, our new um, yeah, papers and as I said ask for, the, for their information and actually I must say that um, last uh, I think it was yeah, last uh, autumn we, we managed to receive some input from them regarding their uh, yeah, water, water management details but uh, we uh, were a bit hesitant of their if they were correct data because they, mm -hmm. they, they seem too small, too low, the amounts, so we can't validate them now on the political level. So that is the one aspect that we can ask some maybe technical information, but the, the correct, is it correct? We, we can't validate them. And it's very difficult to get now their, as I said, their commitments that they are willing to commit into making the Baltic Sea environment better. Mm -hmm. So these commitments should come from the political level, but this is, we are not there yet. So there could be some tech, you know, technical, scientific cooperation possible, but still very difficult on the, on the Thank you very level. much for this information. Just to tell that um, Estonian Ministry of, Ministry of Foreign Affairs has uh, routinely used scientists as kind of ambassadors. So we have been visiti visiting uh, regularly even countries like Turkmenistan, which are really tough countries, but they are not attacking to the, their neighbors. That's made, that makes difference. And uh, science diplomacy is now uh, uh, picked up on the highest level in European community, the first European science diploma, dip, dip, diplo, diplomacy conference will take place in five weeks in Madrid, just before Christmas in, in December. So um, at least the Estonian forest, Foreign Ministry is suggesting unofficially that keep personal relations with fellow scientists for the case if things start to become better, we know whom to talk to. Not to simple people from street or, sim or, or mm -hmm. just clear ex extension arms of government, but reasonable people who know what is going on and who could take decent decisions. So this is not t um, said out officially, but this seems to be the policy. <coughs> and another aspect is that the two other aspects, like Charles Babbage wrote more than 200 years ago, that bad data are better than no data. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I understand there are cheating, there are information attacks, etc., etc. Et Everything <clears throat> is possible, but the point is different. If we provide correct data and adequate interpretations, they, they do their work slowly, like water dropping on stone, there will be a hole after some time. But actually, Rai has been a real science ambassador between our countries. So what's your perspective on those things? Well, as, uh, as Lee said, this uh, situation with Helcom and also with ICS, uh, where I'm a Finnish delegate, it's, it's, it's very critical because now this, uh, Russia is suspended, not removed from this organization, but this suspension time, it's a transition time. We cannot keep them suspended. It's not only economical question because they are not paying the national contributions, which of course will harm the budget of those institutes. But for example, in the ICS, Russia has said that if they are not taken back, they will resign themselves and that will be very harmful that 
it's very difficult to say, to see that if a country is removed or goes out itself, that it will come back very soon. What about with relation? I fully agree that if the situation becomes better, then at e even a little bit the uh, discussion of environmental question is, is something which we can start with because it's somehow neutral. Everybody is interested about this, uh, the well-being of the Baltic Sea. But, but still today I, I have the experience from the late states of the Soviet Union where we could have a relation to come to Soviet Estonia and to, to Leningrad to keep in contact. Maybe we were a little bit kept on, on the eye by the authorities, but as long as we did not talk about politics but did science, I think that there was not so much harm caused to us. But still today, as Tarmo said, that we should keep this uh, network. It's very difficult because at least I think that I have a lot of contacts, of course, in Russia, but, um, but if I would now make a, some contact with Russian colleagues, I, I am afraid that I could cause them a lot of troubles because they would be immediately blamed to be some uh, foreign <coughs> agent and put to prison maybe to 15 years. So the situation is now much more, it's much worse than during the Cold War time after the, after the, after 60s, so to say. So I, I really, don't know, and if the situation improves, then then we have to, to, to unfortunately get the picture, that uh, full picture again, who is still in the science, who has left Russia, who has been forced to do something else for a living and are not maybe going back to, to science. So it's, the, we will only meet some ruins of this network, which we had still two years ago in this hall, by the way. Yes, this is a situ situation, unfortunately, and there is not much we can do uh, in res this respect. But still, uh, we are living here, not only on latitude 58 and higher, but also in a very eastern latitude. So we can't ignore the situation that we do have a massive, powerful and almost unpredictable neighbor. Uh, in this situation, Kazakhstan uh, has a much wor worse case. Uh, they ha Kazakhstan has two such neighbors. Uh, so maybe the re uh, a good solution is to contact with these, those guys here and ask how they manage the situation. But okay, going back now closer to the Gulf of Finland situation, we have been thinking here how we could spread the experience and knowledge gathered uh, in the Gulf of Finland science, having in mind that it is extremely variable every, everywhere, starting from the formal geometry and ending up with, with uh, old <coughs> uh, bottom depositions. Uh, and here I now I'm approaching Loretta with a reverted question. Um, we do not have much uh, sandy beaches here in the, in the Gulf of Finland. The longest in Estonia is about 10 kilometers near Narva, and there are very interesting uh, uh, sand formations. Oh, I have all, again t tell the word Russia in the Russian part of the Gulf of Finland with slanted fetch effects and, and waves approaching on the very large angle to the shoreline have created instability of shoreline, which is one of the unique things in the world. So, Loretta, how your research uh, to open sandy beaches could help us in understanding what happens in the Gulf of Finland sandy beaches? You know, Tarma, I'm very surprised that you said that here in Estonia you don't have sandy beaches. So far as, uh, as I remember, uh, so 16 years ago I was brought to the sandy beach on Ayagna Island. Where the oh, that sand was 200 meters long. Uh, but, but the sand grind was about that size. <laughs> <laughs> so everything depends on the point of view. And you know, the sand is uh, quite interesting substance. It usually goes from one country to other country without looking to the borders. And as we Lithuanians always complain that our sands are going to Latvians, 
Latvians complains that it's going into the Gulf of Riga and then to the Pernum, which is already in, in, in Estonia. And in Gulf of Finland, uh, also we may see the so similar paths and uh, here um, that sand which is moving and actually uh, nowadays with the with the, the changing climate conditions uh, are becoming uh, as expensive as gold uh, we should not forget that in few years uh, Lithuanian, Latvian, and Estonian might be the perfect place for summer vacations for the people for further north because plus 25 is much better than plus 40 and 50 mm -hmm. in Italy. Yeah, so it's, uh, and here um, um, that even if we have short, not we, you, have short uh, stretches of the sand, it should be, we should change our attitude to that sand, to that sand on the shore. And as you saw in my presentation, that actually even small stretch of the sandy coast is valuable. And uh, valuable for the people. And not only during the, uh, the sum summertime. Uh, in the winter, it's also valuable because it's very nice just to go and to walk. And <coughs> in the Gulf of Finland, uh, actually, you don't know, maybe you have some extra resources of, of the sand which may be reused. And what we say that from the geological uh, point of view, <coughs> the black sand, it's not bad sand. Yeah, so it's just have some information about what was a few thousand years ago in this area. Um, so we should look into the sand, not only in the terms of the sediment transport, but look at it as a future resource in the economical perspectives. I like your question. I can talk about sand age. <coughs> and I forgot the question. Sorry. Okay, that will be um, snack time in, in uh, very soon. So we, ca we shall continue then. Um, but it's clear that sand is an asset. Uh, and, and what I really like uh, from this conference uh, are the attempts of quantifying unquantifiable. Uh, just to provide one uh, parallel. There is some research how to uh, assign monetary value to beaches. Uh, they are made in a few locations of the world. I think most notably in Israel, they know what, 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 that the money is is important thing. And typically a two kilometer long uh, sandy beach is worth of about 40 millions of turnover of, of economy connected to this sandy beach. And when you ask 100,000 uh, dollars or euro for replenishing sandy beach, there is no money for that. <laughs> so in some sense, our understanding is so strongly asymmetric. And I, I always like the, the thought that our world is asymmetric. The, fool, uh, the smartness of people is limited, but fullness is not. Um, uh, we have heard from Penti today a very nice exercise of esti estimates of how many break, uh, uh, icebreakers we need in, in different countries and regions. Um, so, and we have also discussion about research vessels. So if you now try to extrapolate your analysis in a rapid way, just in, 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 uh, in coming 10 seconds, what's your estimate how many research vessels we need uh, in the Baltic Sea area? <laughs> we heard a good uh, presentation today about that. So uh, it's a good question because I know in Germany at the moment they have a they are putting a lot of money uh, to make a research vessel that you can research everything. This autonomous shipping, new fuel, ice breaking, uh, that's the future that we can win with data. Uh, so something like that, that we make a good research vessel that we can do everything on board the vessel. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and I, I don't know, maybe you're not 
Me ei pidä namba, but the quality is another one. So uh, we can maybe think about if Germany is making one, maybe we can think about together, make think something similar that next next research vessel is that we can study. We can study environment, we can study oceans, and but we can also study this kind of a ship design type of thing. So maybe the research vessel historically are too limited. So I, I think that not the not the amount, but the quality is more important. <laughs> okay, Kai, <laughs> and then Loretta, please. <laughs> well, just a, first, an uh, old anecdote. When I was working in the Finnish Institute of Marine Research for a long time ago, my boss was Professor Pentti Malki, and when I got some new computer, because I was doing modeling, he said that he was, uh, I said, I'm very happy with this computer, and he said that don't say it because immediately you take some more high resolution version out of your model, and next day you come to see him, say to me that again this computer is very slow. So when it comes to the research vessel, I think that it's up to what we are doing, because for example in Finland we are now doing quite much this helco monitoring, but of course if we would have a lot of ship time, we would have a uh, could have a different research project, and then we could cover e easily the whole year with Aranda and take maybe some smaller vessel to the coastal research. So it's also, so to say, depending what we are really what we are doing and what are the resources. So I, I think two vessels would be <laughs> beneficial at least for the Baltic Sea, one for the open and one for the coast. But of course, mm -hmm. that is not enough. But at least I think four or five vessels could cover it if we are doing the results all around the year, with ice, some of them with ice classification and some with not, and some really specified to open sea condition and some with some uh, uh, co coastal conditions. Yes, that's true. There is uh, very little systematic coastal research in the Baltic Sea area. There is a little bit, but, but not really enough. But Loretta, that what I wanted to just continue, that uh, Lithuania with only 90 kilometers uh, uh, coast length uh, with the Baltic Sea, we have two research vessels. One belongs to the Klippede University, so a big one, like something similar to, to okay, it's not icebreaker, but it's fully equipped with the, for, for the geological uh, works uh, and it spends mostly time even outside the Baltic. But we have the second research vessel, which is, belongs to the Lithuanian Environmental Ministry, the UNOS, which is uh, designed to make to, to do monitoring in the Koronian Lagoon, which around is not suitable to go to the lagoons. Mm -hmm. Yes, and even our I mean, this is not not good to go to the lagoons. So it's. <laughs> <laughs> but even that, uh, our catamaran is is not good to, to make uh, in, sh um, in the coastal area. So we still have that gap uh, between zero to uh, five meters uh, uh, de depth. And uh, how to solve that problem, which is uh, where is the mostly interesting things happens, especially from the small scale uh, sediment sediment transport. It's like uh, we had that famous experiment in the, that uh, for the sediment transport uh, rate evaluation when uh, our equipment was covered by the sand. So we know that we have enough sand on the Cronian uh, spit, uh, but uh, we still don't, don't know the exact rate of that sediment transport. Not yet. There is still one person to whom I I had a specific question, so I get specifically the last. So uh, you won the ERC grant. Congratulations about that. Uh, now the question is twofold: What's your main idea, and whether it the part, whether it, it is somehow connected to the Baltic Sea problems? Yeah. So the idea of this ERC is about understanding the sediment transport processes, but also look at what is happening to the soil. I think when we uh, take this hydraulic or coastal perspective, uh, it's very separate from what the geotechnical people think. Uh, and the idea is to bring those two disciplines together and uh, have a unified framework to understand how sediment is transported, but then also how the, the bed is deforming. And uh, there are a couple of 
uh, important uh, areas where this can be relevant. For example, in Norway, we have a lot of um, landslides impacting our infrastructure. And then it's also there the interaction between the water and the soil, this understanding. But uh, when we come to the coast, it's the, especially the cross-shore sediment transport where it's relevant, where we have uh, collapsing beaches uh, due to extreme uh, storm events. Uh, so I think that's where uh, this project can make a contribution. There's the challenge of having very small scales on the one side. We have particles which are extremely small. Uh, then all the other um, yeah, current and, and waves, those effects, they are happening on, on larger scales. So what we are trying to do is uh, bridge this uh, in our framework, having different models for the different scales that they can interact with each other. Uh, so, I, in that sense, we can probably take a bit more short-term and local uh, perspective understanding uh, processes at the Baltic coast as well. So, basically, underwater uh, computational morphology. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, then also specifically driven, driven by extreme sea states. That's what uh, we would like to... We can provide on. some extreme yes. sea states <laughs> to you. As you have seen, uh, significant, yeah. significant wave height in the Gulf of Finland, almost 5.8 meters, which was really thought nice, to yeah. be absolutely impossible. Uh, all uh, wave scientists until 2001 uh, were certain that significant wave height never will exceed 4 meters in Gulf of Finland. But you know, the nature didn't care about those <laughs> things, and now we have well above that level. If it, it, if it hasn't been too boring, then no questions from the audience, please. Yes, please uh, take a microphone so that uh, those who fo follow us can also have the question. All right, thank you. Uh, while you guys were on the topic of research vessels, there's uh, one thing I'd like to comment on, on the, on the uh, amount of how many would you need in, in uh, different par parts of the Baltic or all of the Baltic. <laughs> Excuse me. The, the, the main, main thing here is, again, if we are in any way successful in future in this TNA, the transnational axis, and able to combine our forces better, we could have several research vessels, all of them with different capacities. One big thing in us getting the new Aranda in, in <coughs> towards the end of 80s was that at that time, there was a strong shipbuilding industry in Finland, and also Finland has, had, had joined the Antarctic Treaty. And that meant that Aranda went to Antarctic two times. And it has been many, many times in polar regions when Finland still did serious marine research, which we don't knew, do presently. Anyway, do we need another polar ride vessel? I think we do. And there would be use for it. So Aranda, or whatever the new ship is, it could be a polar vessel, it could be used for winter time monitoring in any kind of uh, uh, circumstances that the, that the Baltic may throw at us. And then in the summertime, use her in, in the Arctic for three season uh, ice edge work, which she would be very capable of. And in the meanwhile, use different uh, uh, research vessels or even ships of opportunity for, for offshore and, and maritime or uh, coastal monitoring. But I would like, like to ask the panelists another question, if, if that's okay. Okay, uh, one thing that hasn't come up here yet, we have talked about uh, the sediments and, and, and the, uh, the uh, uh, nutrient loading and, and whatnot. Uh, the fact is that Gulf of Finland is one of the most significant waterways in the world and, and a, a very, very important trade route, especially after 1700 when, when Peter the Great stamped his hat into the bog at the end of it and, and decided, okay, the new guys, the new capital will be here. Every, every war that has been fought in the Northern Hemisphere has been fought here. And in both World War Wars, the Gulf of Finland was the most heavily mined sea area in the world. And as a result, we got a, a, we got a, a, a multitude of wrecks on the seabed. And many of these wrecks are actually environmentally hazardous. And, and the work has already, already begun. It has been up on, in, in Helcom, the Hel Helcom submerged. And, and, and we are actually, from, from the start of this year, Suke has been responsible for, for doing the pre-salvage survey and data gathering of these wrecks, and this is what we're doing. Now we have seen that uh, some malevolent factor has used a ship of opportunity to drag anchor and damage uh, 
underwater uh, uh, cables and, and, and gas, gas pipelines. What we have between us here, between the Naisar and Porkkala, it's an area which, with a good reason, can be called the Iron Bottom Sound, because there are so many wrecks there. And there are several, for instance, several destroyer wrecks. I just made a quick calculation. One single uh, Mob 36B, this German destroyer, still carries about 35,000 tons of ordnance on board. And, and this is not, this, this is ton, tonnage is the, the amount of explosives, and it's all packed in, in, in project, projectiles, in steel casings. So the, the destructive power is, re, is really big. And in addition, there's about 300 tons of, of oil still on board in the bunker tanks. So if somebody would want to cause significant mischief to Estonia and Finland, and did just a little bit under, underwater work, and I know it's quite possible since I have visited personally all of these wrecks and put up some detonation, detonative devices in there. That would be a bang that we will hear here in, in Tallinn and also in Helsinki. And then everything will be all around. We have sampled that area, for instance. There's a lot of oils in the sediment. Do you see this as any kind of a danger? <laughs> <laughs> okay, then start from Loretta, then Ivo, then, then Kai. I have very short answer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and or the question, what to do? Yeah. I, do? I, I, I didn't ask that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just yes. Mm. Yes. <laughs> yes, I will, please. Uh, yes, I think this is a very important point that you brought up. And we have. The technology is all there. We have all, all the tools in our hand to do the proper mapping of the seafloor, really to lo locate what are the hotspots for these kind of environmental concerns and go down with ROVs and, and, and really assess whether, whether, these, whether there are leakages, leakages possible, whether the, the, the ammunition or whatever is in, in these ship's rack is, is safer or need to be handled. Because, as I said before, we have unique resource, what we have to, uh, what we have to, to, uh, to take, take the good care of. And, Yes, we need a proper seafloor mapping program, uh, programs that, in addition to the, to the natural uh, variations, also take good care of these anthrop anthropogenic dis disturbances of the seafloor. And as we have seen with these anchoring uh, uh, drama recently now in the, uh, disrupting the, the pipeline, but we have anchoring in Estonian waters of the, of the Gulf of Finland. There are two, 20, 15 big tankers every day there and, and dragging and, and vandalizing our, our unique seafloor. This, as a marine geologist, this really, this really bleeds my heart. And, and, and why, why we are not doing it? Why don't we get our politicians behind, behind, behind it? Because mm. the vessels can be organized, the technology is all, all there to, to really take good care of our unique resources. Thanks for bringing this up. This is a very important point. And the fact is, that at, at least on the, the, the Finnish side, this mapping has already been done. The problem is that it's, it's, all the data is in, in the hands of the, of the defensive forces and due to its sensitivity, it's not public. And whenever we do seafloor mapping on Aranda with our multi-beams or whatever, it's, that, that data is highly sensitive. And everything needs to be obeyed by the, by, the, by the Navy and all the data is in, in, in safes and so on. But I agree with you, we should really uh, get together a, a, a common database where you can see everything. There's actually a, a room in a cellar in somewhere in Finland, I have been in that room. And there's a 10 meter wide wall and a complete picture of under, under, underwater Gulf of Finland in there. You can even pick up Rex on that. <laughs> okay. You're actually allowed to take uh, your cell phones into that room. <laughs> That's right, yes. Sky, please. Well, I think that Europa is completely right. The answer is, of course, yes, that this kind of harm can be used. And the other qu question is that if it's quite logical if you want to, to occupy another country, you, your country is bigger and you have a bigger power in the world. That's some unacceptable, but it's logical. But if you just destroy some old wrecks in the sea bottom, it's, it's senseless terrorism. It doesn't lead to anything. Nobody is winning anything from which. So it, it means that if Russia or any other country will do it, then they are simply desperate that it's a sign of a, 
of a ruining country. But they can do it. Yeah. Yes, and it means that they shouldn't know where the wrecks are. Yeah. Loretta had oh, uh, just to uh, short just comment that uh, yes. why in, on the Lithuanian side uh, we have so small amount of monitoring points uh, only because uh, it's quite hard to find other places where it's safe to take samples on the soil. You actually touched a much more gen general question about uh, open science, open access, open data. Those principles work nicely in a democratic world, but they do not work at all in polarized worlds. So we, I mean here, we academies of sciences over Europe and chief science advisors to the European Commission, we have asked the European Commission to switch down uh, the use of uh, open databases for Russia and Belarus. Uh, Russia is using European databases for targeting what exactly they bomb. That has been, hasn't been even a response. That's so much about policy making. But we keep, uh, uh, keep pressure. It is complicated. We don't want to close down open science as a principle, but it really doesn't work in a polarized world. Uh, but I would like possibly to switch to some more bright topics. Anybody has a question about our bright future? No. No. You shouldn't be so pessimistic. Otherwise, I shall ask. That's, mu that's much worse. <laughs> if not, uh, then you can now ask each other questions, if you wish. <laughs> I, then I w wish to ask about the bright future yes. for the uh, person from the... Uh, you, you may ask the audience. Uh, then it will be not nice questions <laughs> for the Ministry from the Climate. Do you have any plans how to use here in Estonia that uh, possibility that uh, with the rising uh, atmospheric temperature, this part of the world will become most, more useful, more suitable for the leisure tourists? <laughs> this cool question to the Ministry of Climate, I must say. <laughs> But actually, regarding uh, coastal tourism, uh, this is a topic that is in between of, of two ministries, so still it's in the economic ministry as well. So, uh, of course, there might, uh, might come possible p possibilities, but on the other hand, we still need to be or need to make sure that the, these possibilities are sustainable and they won't uh, mess up uh, our natural resources more. As if we are inviting tourists, more tourists here, we give them uh, good possibilities, uh, then yeah, really, we, we need to see that this, uh, this part of economy really suits in the, in the nature. <laughs> uh, that is actually, yeah, this is, uh, this is one possibility. <laughs> yeah. uh, wait for microphone, please. <laughs> just uh, just a, a couple of couple of days ago, there, there was a main main uh, national news in Finland that uh, travel foreign travel to the Saimaa region, which is a big lake in in, in uh, central eastern Finland, it has exploded, and, and the, there's so much demand for the coming summer and fall that uh, that they just can't meet it. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, that was actually the same concerns that it needs to be held. Uh, sustainable mm. and 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 all the all the entrepreneurs in the area agree that yes we will we will keep it eco-friendly and very expensive and nice mm -hmm. yeah because uh, actually we have the the idea of developing a blue economy roadmap in Estonia and I I believe that uh, this uh, coastal tourism and, and development of coastal tourism uh, is also part of that it, it goes uh, partially in there as uh, yeah it's part of blue economy but sustainable future <laughs> So the coast will be much more valuable asset in, in the future, and it's absolutely natural because coast is a line object, uh, uh, differently from area, which is an area object. So if you put, if you distribute all Estonians over the area, then you get something like 29 persons per square kilometer. But if you put them all on, on the coastline, then you get almost um, a continuous row. <laughs> who was showing that. Uh, yes, um, I think now it's time for everybody from the panel to prepare 
maximum one minute statement, what you think your science could do for building the future which is worth living in. And Kai, you start. Yes, I think that after this very sad moment, I think that the bright future is that at some time we, we can start to cooperate again with Russia. Maybe it's one year or 100 years, but then <laughs> science has, and the Baltic Sea science is one of the first key issues which can be done even in bad political condition, but not during the war, but I'm sure that the scientists are then asked by the, the governments to do the job and we have to be prepared. Maybe it's not our generation which will do it, but sometime it will happen and we have to be ready for that. Thank you. Okay, then I have to say you, Hans is the next. Okay, bright future. Yes. Um, yeah, we are we are working with open source software, and uh, what we see is really this uh, benefits uh, a lot of different uh, groups, students, researchers, uh, engineers out there. And so I think where I see a lot of positivity is that uh, yeah, open source development, uh, community based software uh, is helping really everybody, and uh, we do our small part and contribute. And but we also see a lot of other people doing that, so that uh, is something I see very positive now and also for the future. Thank you. Loretta. And I'm happy that uh, I'm an example of uh, interdisciplinarity, when that we can change from one area to other, and I'm really happy that um, as now I'm working at the Institute of, at the Klippeter, where I'm mostly uh, packed with a biologist, so I learned that language also, and that we, what I wish, that uh, we would find the way how to translate our language, language of science, uh, into the more understandable way. So we learn already how to talk with the citizens. So they started to understand what, what, what we are willing to say to them and what, uh, what idea we, we brought to them. Uh, but I also willing that a uh, politician would also Okay, I don't believe that they will learn our language, but that we will learn how to translate it and to bring the uh, key messages to them into the understandable way and uh, that they catch it and they understood the, what is the valuable value of our knowledge, of our data, and for their decisions. Absolutely. It's basically rephrasing the position of Rocha Marx, the great entertainer um, in the United States, who had two points. First, he told that before I go out to stage, I have to have something to say. And second, it's the task of entertainer or speaker uh, to sh ensure that the audience understands the message, not the task of audience. Pentley, please. Okay, I can I continue to win young presentation. The big, big data is a thing and cooperation because we have been very separate, uh, maritime transport and environment, but as we heard from uh, Min Young, he was, we can put together all the data nowadays. We have emerald data, we have bottom data, we have traffic data, we have ship data, we have all, and, uh, and uh, we have the tools to understand better the whole systems together. And together we have to do it. And so that's the bright future that we, we know much better what's ongoing on the sea, on, 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 the, on, on sea transport. And what on the sea, we know much better than 20 years ago. We need, need nothing. We did know nothing. <laughs> when the vessel left the harbor, we saw them last time, next time, two months, and we didn't know what happened between the two months. But now, nowadays, we know everything. Thank good you. And good, Lise, good or bad. And Lise, you may say what uh, to your understanding scientists should do to reach the future worth living in. Uh, well, from, from my side and from my position, I, I am uh, just. Uh, Hoping that uh, all the our Estonian and the other uh, countries, uh, regional regional Helcom countries, uh, scientists continue cooperation uh, in in research. And uh, we, even though in the in the Helcom family we ha we have one this uh, not very cooperative partner, we the others are still giving their input, and uh, all together we can make uh, the Baltic Sea state better. So. And Ayo has 
The last word from the panel. <laughs> well, let's see how this goes. Uh, uh, yes, um, so what makes me really happy about the, the marine geology in Estonia under spearheading of the Estonian Geological Survey has got some, some serious wind into its sail over the last couple of years. And, and this is really encouraging. And, and this is not the work what is being done in Estonia here, but these are several international collaborations across the Gulf of Finland, across the entire, entire Baltic Sea, and numerous international cruises, not numerous, two, three, international <laughs> cruises have been organized over the past two years now, bringing together and really trying to, to, to squeeze the interesting science and environmental concerns out of the, out of the Gulf of Finland the best, the best we can. And the, the, and the extra bonus to all that is that we do all ex excellent science and have our dreams and, and things that keep us uh, awake during the night. But extra bonus is that we have the young, bright students working for us from Tartu and Tallinn universities. This which gives us the assurance that the Estonian marine geology will be in safe hands. Great. That was a very positive note. <laughs> Thanks a lot to the <laughs> panelists. Um, And now the instructions about the evening snack. Uh, the general instruction is that uh, come uh, more or less in time because the few first drinks will be paid by the anonymous uh, taxpayer and later drinks will be paid by the um, particular taxpayer who is ordering the drink. Also taxpayers' money. We all are taxpayers. So the place is called Hellhund. Uh, address you have on the, on the program, Pick Street 39. If you go out here, you just turn to the left. Then go down, keep going, and look at the left. Uh, the name of this uh, pub could be interpreted in, in great many different ways. If you try, depending on which word of those two you translate into English. If you translate both words, it's a Caressing, caressing uh, wolf. If you translate just one word, it could be a very caressing gaming exercise. But it could be also understood as a hunting for the hell. And in this sense, I have an uh, instruction from Winston Churchill, who told somewhere in the times of Second World War, if you have to walk through the hell, just keep going. Have a nice evening.